Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start the broadcast. It's not going to start yet, but... <laughs> but... Now the audio connection is lost. Okay, can I, can I use your computer? Gabe, can you hear me? I thought this issue was fixed. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, Gabe. Can you hear me? Everything's looking good. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I can see that... <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to test it out, so I did have a little bit of time to uh, fix it if it, there was an issue. Um, I'm really sorry you don't have your kit yet. I don't know. As far as I'm, the last I heard, it was on its way to you. So I just messaged Mr. Dubik, um, and maybe he will give me an update within the hour, hopefully. Um, and if not, I'll... Uh, keep pressing them. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say other than I'm really sorry about that. Architecture. Probably our last lecture on ancient engineering. We'll be moving into some uh, more web work next time. I know. Well, if you... I'll, what I'll do for you, Gabe, is I'll try to get on here uh, early like I did today, or um, I can always stay, I can definitely stay later um, to help you out with any questions you might have. Okay. Um, well, later would be, I don't get home until about then either. So uh, if you, can, are you able to stay later? Definitely. Okay. So if you ha ever have any questions, I'll just stick around after the normal webinar and we'll uh, take care of it then. Any questions you have? Guys? And I can go, I can even review um, some slides. I'll pull up whatever slides are relevant if you would like to see the slides next to. Um, the rest. Oh, and also, um, so we never got the problem resolved last during the last lecture, but we did cover some more material. Um, did you get my email about the competition? No. Can you give me uh, send me your Gmail?
Okay, I just sent you an email. Um, just confirm with me once you get it. Um, And it has uh, some competition details as well as um, three those three uh, projects. Yeah, I don't know why this is struggling. Hi, Raiden. You can hear me this time, right, Jaden? Great. Well, we're five minutes past, so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, oh my gosh, I can. S your screen isn't loading, still, is it? Hi, hey, Kayla. Um. Well. So you can hear me this time, but you can't see any screen. I could have I did this the other day, and it was just fine. So I don't know what's going on. This is really, I know it's really frustrating for you guys. But it's also really frustrating for me. Give me one second.
Okay, guys, it looks like it's loading. Um, if it stops, well, I don't know, but let's just keep on going while it's good. Well, it looks good. Um, so, uh, this time we'll be talking about ancient engineering uh, architecture and architects. Um, and before we get going too far, don't forget uh, to enter your seed weapon uh, photo or video by midnight today um, to uh, enter in the competition. So, what is an architect? Uh, an architect, it's not at all modern. Um, it's derived from ancient Greek architecton, uh, meaning chief carpenter, uh, which is still very relevant today. Um, Albert Speer is one of the great architects Gabe is reminding us. Yes, that's true, Gabe. So the most basic definition uh, of an architect is one who is professional and qualified to design and provide advice on aesthetic and technical objects. But uh, throughout history, uh, architects have also served uh, as trusted advisors, um, it, well, reading here, blending diverse requirements and disciplines in a creative process, which means uh, blending, merging the the visual aspects of the culture, um, making making the the culture visually appealing, and you know, serving the needs of the public interest while creating a visual theme. Um, so, it mixes art and science, aesthetics and engineering. Um, it's uh, and it, it it's one of the the main things we have today that reflects uh, what a culture was like um, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Um, and uh, it can tell us, we can learn a lot from the design principles that the architects used and what they understood and what they didn't understand. And we'll see that uh, later today. So a brief history of architecture. First, the prehistoric age, um, architects made very basic things, uh, megaliths, obelisks, thatched huts, and earthen mounds, um, very puzzling. Um, still nobody knows for sure what Stonehenge uh, is meant to do or what purpose it serves. Um, it's a uh, yes, Gabe? They have found a lot about it. Is it is Gabe says they've found a, little, a lot about it. I didn't know that, but um, the stone meaning as cold death and hard bodies, and you got wood hinge. Okay, Gabe. Um, well, uh, I guess I need to update my facts. Um, but as far as I've heard. Uh, they're, they they didn't know about it, but uh, I'll do some more research on that. Um, so here's uh, some more examples um, of ancient architecture. Um, these are uh, likely meant to be some form of gods facing um, the directions. Very big mounds, yes. Um, not man-made mounds. Gabe says there are waypoints into the in the land. Um, so uh, then we go up, bring ourselves up to oh Gabe said uh, waypoints from back, and then you can find a town from anywhere. Yes, um, that is uh, that's a good point. Um, the old Norse homes in the ground. Sorry, this is a little. Difficult to. Uh, you did a ton of research about this. That's awesome, Gabe. Maybe uh, you could uh, keep keep sharing if I. You can keep me on track because um, uh, it sounds like you've done more research than I have. 
So um, uh, these are apparently waypoints uh, so that you can see from far off where the, you know, that you're going on the right way, going in the right way. Um, and then uh, we bring ourselves up to uh, one of the earliest or one of the earlier uh, ancient civilizations of Egypt. Um, architects, uh, we all know they built the gigantic temples, um, the pyramids um, used to commemor com uh, commemorate uh, the, their leaders, uh, the pharaohs of Egypt, uh, mostly using granite and limestone. Um, they uh, were they, all of their monuments and tombs were tall, uh, specifically because um, they had a wide base, which is a very uh, ancient way of uh, building buildings, uh, having the wide base support narrower and narrower levels. Um, uh, and this is one of the examples, the step pyramid of, uh, I'm not sure if I can pronounce this right, uh, Diyasser, uh, designed by Imhota. Um, so this is one of the earliest massive stone monuments, aka pyramid, if that qualifies, even though because it's got the ledges, but um, uh, many more came. Um, most uh, pyramids were built to be more and more impressive than the last, um, and uh, even contained underground uh, uh, caverns dug out. Um, but one of the, oh, well, uh, yeah, so then we can go into the classical age um, in you know, classical architecture, um, spanning uh, Greece and Rome, um, where they began to actually use mathematical principles um, in their designs um, before they were built. So they, the Egyptian pyramids were still um, designed, just aligned using um, less mathematical principles, um, more uh, trial and error processes. Um, but uh, we'll see some examples of the mathematical principles uh, used to design uh, some Roman and Greek uh, structures. Uh, these principles are also known as the classical orders um, and are relevant today. So, uh, also Greek architecture, um, Stonehenge was actually rocks from all over the region, Gabe says, and from what we know, it took over a hundred men to carry all one all the way back to that place. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, that's a lot of guys. Um, so, um, the ancient Greeks um, typically built on the highest ground um, and had their uh, monuments and temples uh, in very visible places because that made them better symbols of society and culture when they were raised up above everything else. So there's the, the Greeks have the three orders of architecture, um, which means it, it's ruled by a strict system of proportions um, that relates everything together. Um, and we can see this partially in the different styles. Um, I'm, you may have heard of the Doric and Ionic and Corinthian columns. Um, the, where they all have uh, orders of details, um, especially found in the moldings of the... Okay, I'll speak slower. Is it... Can you still understand me? Can you guys understand me, or is it 
really dying. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So the the three orders of architecture can be seen, uh, especially in the columns, um, where you have its its own level of detail found in uh, the you know the molding of and the ornamentation of the the piece of architecture. Um, so this is this is an example of using proportions. Okay, Jaden. Um, this is an example of how they use proportions to design their buildings. Um, the uh, for this one, for example, has a lot to do with the proportion of uh, root five to one, um, which root five two squared is four, so uh, two point a little bit more is root five, so that means the, you know, for example, in this, from D to A, uh, that line up is one a unit, and then A to that, uh, to the end of the rectangle that A goes to, um, is uh, root five, so two point a little bit. And uh, for whatever reason, they chose that, um, it, uh, I mean, they, they chose it because of its principles of design, um, probably because it worked well in the past and uh, the Greeks were big fans of um, uh, seeing, seeing, finding patterns in, uh, in design. Um, so they were one of the early ones to do that. So the the Doric columns, which is the uh, most basic uh, of the three orders, um, or it's, it's, Doric isn't Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian aren't the three orders, but they're the three orders of columns. There's three orders of other things as well, um, but the uh, the Doric columns date back to the seventh century. Um, all right, Gabe. Uh, Uh, the, so, the, uh, basically, it's a plain top, um, very simple style, whereas the ionic columns uh, have a, just a very little scroll work uh, off the top, um, and it's primarily used for smaller buildings um, because that was one of their design principles. Um, the scrolls are its key the key way to, to recognize the ionic columns. And then, um, invented by Callimachus from Corinth, uh, we get the Corinthian columns. Um, they weren't actually used very much by the Greeks, but uh, they're important because um, they're used later and later on in um, later empires, including um, the, in the early, well, in in the early U.S. and even still, buildings are designed with um, one of the three, typically with one of the three orders of Greek columns. Um, it's Corinthians recognized tra traditionally by its uh, very ornate, flowery, or uh, kind of like petals, and uh, or just very intricate patterns at the top. Um, so, uh, we, I said that you can still see the influence of classical orders in modern architecture. Um, for example, the Abraham Lincoln Memorial uh, uses Doric columns. The Jefferson Memorial, uh, in Was also in Washington, D.C., uses uh, ionic columns. And in New York, the Stock Exchange uh, uses Corinthian columns. And um, it's... I guess not necessarily a big surprise that the stock exchange, which is um, very focused on money, uh, picks the mo you know chooses the most ornate and intricate and lavish columns to uh, show off to the world. I guess um, 
It's, it's little design decisions like that. Whereas memorials typically don't want to show off the splendor of war. That's not the point, right? It's their memorials to commemorate things, and they they're very much more um, simple uh, because that's that's part of the design, and that's part of the uh, feeling that when you look at it, you shouldn't look at be, be looking at something that's lavish, but rather looking at something that um, is elegant and um, so that, that speaks, that's a little bit, speaks to a little bit of why they chose these design elements. Um, so the Parthenon uh, is one of these, one of the Greek, um, or, uh, the famous Greek temples located in Athens um, on the hill, the Acropolis Hill, which uh, translates to high city. Um, the uh, inside the Parthenon, um, the Athena, the daughter of Zeus and Metis, um, is who's the goddess. Athena is the goddess of wisdom and military victory. Um, she is the patron uh, patron goddess of Athens. What are we doing after ancient engineering, Jaden? Um, I believe we're working on. We're going to go into some uh, web related stuff. Um, I will get back to that after class, too, just in case I'm wrong. Um, but towards the end of class, remind me. Um, all right. Uh, I have to double check. So um, the ending of the Odyssey was weird. What does what does the Odyssey have to do with this game? Oh, the Odyssey, the book. Okay. Athena helps, basically helps him kill everyone. Yes, that is a strange book. Um, but um, for uh, that's... Uh, that's a one of the the tales of um, of Athena, but for Athens, Athena was um, was you know was was a lot more than even just you know the Odyssey and that sort of thing. But it was uh, they were everything about um, Athena. They they really focused on the traits of of wisdom and military victory. Um, and so this was this was their they're basically their idol, and so they put her at the top of the city um, with these um, with this design. So uh, it was constructed in under ten years, which for the time um, is pretty incredible um, by the architects Iktanos and Kalikrates, and. Uh, contained two back-to-back -back halls. One's a smaller one and one's a bigger one. The Apistodomos, Apistodomos, I guess, this is the smaller inner hall with the temple um, inside. And then there's the cella, which is the main room. Uh, oh, that actually had the statue of Athena. Um, so... Uh, Based on what I told you about the um, the different statue or the different uh, designs of the columns, the Ionic, Dor Dor uh, Doric, and Corinthian, what kinds of columns do you think would the Apostodomos have and the Cella have? I'll go back to see so you can see the the definitions. Do you have any guesses? Anyone want to take a, I guess, you might get lucky. You only have, you could get 
There's only three choices. I'll give you a hint. One of them, the opus thodomus, is smaller than the cella. Okay, that's fine. I'll keep going. Um, so the Doric columns were simple and stocky, whereas the Ionic were used for smaller buildings and interiors. So the cella, um, would, the, which was bigger, uh, used the Doric columns, and the smaller interior used Ionic columns, the Epistodomus. Um, so the Parthenon, uh, its foundation was made of limestone, and columns made out of marble, um, which uh, was uh, another architectural design choice because those materials are a lot more expensive. Previously, um, the, the simpler temples, the Doric, using Doric columns, were made out of wood. Um, but the Athenians wanted something more permanent and longer lasting. Um, which, considering this is what it looks like today, um, I'll give you a second for this to load, um, considering that the Parthenon is still there today, um, that is, and, it, and they built it in only 10 years, it's lasted for around almost two and a half millennia. Um, that you know, nothing, nothing we build today, almost nothing we build today um, lasts that long. Uh, it hardly lasts 20 to 30 years before we tend to rebuild. So uh, that, you know, that's a design choice. Um, they wanted something permanent because they felt like as an empire that they wanted, I mean, they wanted to rule permanently. Um, so, I mean, they didn't, but that was that was their idea, and they did rule for an extraordinarily long time. So keep going. Um, and one of the ways they were able to, to do this was because they were very wealthy. Uh, they were very good at war, and so they uh, were able to um, uh, either take or acquire a lot of their wealth. And they also used slaves, which um, you know, was a cheap source of, uh, of uh, labor. Thanks, Jaden. So one of the elements that they used, um, it's pretty early, uh, is the post and lintel. Um, you can see here the posts go straight up, and the lintel lays right across them. Um, no mortar, just stones resting on top of stones, um, similar to Stonehenge even. Um, and so these arrows here are showing um, where the forces are. The, so the, the main force uh, in this stone slab on the top is in the middle, and it's supported on the outside, um, and that keeps it up. Um, it's simple. Uh, it's very simple, and but it used 20,000 tons of marble. Um, that might give you an idea of the wealth of the Athenian, Athenians, um, but also some of their ingenuity, um, because that's a lot of marble, and there's no way that they were going to carry that much marble onto the top of their, big, their tallest hill. Um, so what did they do? They use simple machines. Um, yes, exactly, Jaden. One square foot of marble countertop costs around sixty dollars. Um, that, um, you know, I don't know if that was similar to the price, but I wouldn't be surprised if the price of marble was similar then uh, as it is today. Um, you just they obviously didn't have dollars, but um, it's expensive stuff. Um, so the 
quarrymen and the stonemasons uh, had iron and wooden tools um, that were, um, well, what, what kinds of, uh, do, you, do you see any simple machines? Jaden says, maybe they forced the quarry to give them discounts. Well, uh, wedges, great. Um, they might not have forced the quarry to give, had to force the quarry to give them discounts because um, they owned the empire. The empire owned all the land um, except for the small sections that they sold to people in the city, wealthy, people, wealthy citizens in the city. And um, they had slaves for labor. So free labor and free land means as long as they can afford to feed the slaves and tell them what to do, then uh, I guess that probably did make it cheaper. Um, but the main one for getting the stone out of the ground, um, as uh, Jaden pointed out, is a wedge. Um, then, oh, actually, you can, there is one, this one tool um, that it's, uh, looks a little bit like a bow, and there's a string going across it, um, and it's got the little round top. Um, so that is one of the early drills. Uh, it's similar to a, a tool that uh, people might have used to start a fire by uh, spinning the drill really quickly. Um, but in this case, it's used to uh, drill a hole into the stone so that you can get um, uh, a wedge further in there. Um, so what they did was they split the rock from the larger segment, split a, a rock piece off of the larger segment um, using wedges and just pounded on them with big hammers uh, until the block eventually came out. Then they used pulleys. You can maybe see the wheels involved here um, and the system getting exactly, Jaden, it is one humongous Lego set. Um, ropes, pulleys, winches, I'm reading this thing because I don't think you can. Uh, well, ropes, pulleys, and winches, as well as levers, wooden beams, rollers, and raw muscle power all help bring the capital to the top of the quarry. Um, remember, as you keep digging down into the quarry, that's that much distance you have to bring it back up out of the quarry. Um, so they had uh, at least two places where they had to, um, you know, they had to bring it out of the quarry and then up to the top of the hill. Usually the quarries are might be nearby, but there's that nearby might, is probably still miles away, so they have to transport those stones uh, quite a long ways. Um, they did that using wagons, which is similar to, uh, well, it's a, I guess it is a wheel and axle system. Um, yep, good one, Jaden. Um, and then they have to pull it up the final ramp, um, which uh, requires another feat of engineering. Uh, you got it, Jaden pulleys, and uh, also a braking system, which is not necessarily a, um, it's not necessarily a simple machine, but uh, it was definitely important because they couldn't pull all at once. They had to uh, keep it from, uh, they had to pull in, in a, like a heave-ho type system where they heave-ho and they, yeah, so it is a wedge behind the wheel. That, is, that would be a, a simple machine. Um, and um, then at the work site, um, this is shows what uh, an example might look. And um, 50 years later, they put the final touches on there using more uh, early cranes um, to lift supplies up to the worker um, up on the top. Uh, you can see another uh, wheel and axle and pulleys like we've been talking about. 
Um, and another interesting uh, decision that they made uh, was that they they knew uh, because the because of the way perspective works, um, they knew that if they built everything a hundred percent perfectly straight, um, it would actually look imperfect. It would kind of like uh, this optical illusion with these lines. These two purple parallel lines are parallel, but it's hard for your eyes to see that because of the sense of perspective. So what they did was um, instead change the curvature of the columns so that when you look at it, it looks like it should be perfect. So what they, what they said that they did was um, the Athenians knew that in a building of such scale that the structure would appear misshapen as the lines to the right do. In other words, a perfect building would appear imperfect, while a carefully, carefully planned imperfect building would appear perfect. So it's a very simple uh, concept, um, but it takes uh, a lot of work to arrive at, um, you know, figuring out how to perfect the look of something like this. So uh, this, fe this feature of perspective is known as entasis, um, or correcting the perspective is entasis, where you, they, they swell outward, like the columns swell outwards to correct the appearance that they're curving inwards. Um, and basically, uh, if, they built, if they built it like the one, like the picture on the left, uh, perfectly straight, it would look more like the picture on the right. It would look imperfect. But when they build it like the picture on the left here, then it looks like the picture on the right. So it looks perfect. Jaden says the lines actually look swollen. Which ones were you talking about? Um, this one right here? Those? Yeah, so they, they look like it, but um, I'll leave this up for just a little, uh, couple of seconds longer. And if you put up something that you know is straight, you can see, I'm doing it right now on my computer, you can see that neither of those are swollen. Um, but you really have to hold up a something that you know is straight right up next to it to tell that it's not actually swollen. You want me to leave it up longer or should we keep going? I know, it's crazy. Okay. So, um, uh, if you look very carefully, you can tell from the picture that um, the, the columns are actually thinner at the top than they are at the bottom. And that's because this picture is taken from higher up. So the sense of perspective from the ground is different than the perspective that you get um, looking up here. But it's very, very difficult to, to tell. Um, and um, yeah. so uh, why is the Parthenon in ruins today? Um, it's not because it just fell apart over the ages. It's actually because of an explosion um, during a battle with the Venetians. Uh, it caused most of the damage seen today. So if it hadn't been uh, in an explosion, um, the Parthenon would probably be still intact today. Um, I'll send you this link right here if you would like to design your own Greek temple. Okay. Um, so hopefully this video works. Um, if not, 
I'll send it to you. I don't think this is very good. Oh, this is a long video. Okay, never mind. This is, um, okay. If you want to design your own Greek temple, there's another video for that. Oops. Um, okay. okay, yes, we're on the right side. Sorry, I think I... How do you add fonts to Open Office? Um, sorry, Gabe, I don't know. I've used Open Office before, but I've never actually added fonts. I would see if there's a forum. I think it's pretty well, doc like they have pretty good documentation on, on their forum. So if you use Google um, Open Office forum, or, then, uh, or even, they, and it might even be on uh, the site, um, Oh, uh, what's that site for? Um, uh, for code problems, uh, site uh, Stack Overflow. I'll send you this link. This is where I would send you for most problems. Like this. That's a good one. Okay, back on track. So that was one of the Greeks' main temples. Um, oh, Jaden says, let's watch it. Okay. Um, Jaden, I'm going to try to finish up the slides. I think we've got, oops, okay, well, that's not going. Okay. Um, we don't have a ton more slides, so I'll, uh, get through the lecture and then, uh, if we have extra time, we'll watch it. Okay, um, so Roman advances. I can stick around later too. Uh, this does take all the 15 minutes. Roman advances. Why is it doing this? Mm, sorry. Back to, no, not chemicals. Back to. just build uh, the Colosseum, uh, which everyone knows about, but, and they also built arches, aqueducts, and um, uh, less, also not, maybe not so well known is uh, that uh, Roman roads were among the first uh, modern roads, um, and we'll, uh, we'll see why. So, what, what are some reasons why roads are important? Well, um, they allow for quick, easy travel, which um, is like a plus 10 to economy and a plus 10 to military um, if you were playing a, a game. But it really strengthens, um, it strengthens the empire by allowing for quick movement so they can, the military can quickly go and put down any revolt or uh, quickly, you know, uh, protect any uh, of their uh, states for against, uh, yeah, threats, threats or threats, rebellions and invasions. Jaden's got it exactly. Um, and uh, when it's safe for travel, um, it really bumps up the economy because you can uh, trade and cities can focus on the things they do best and not worry about the things that they don't, they aren't very good at. Uh, for example, the Venetians uh, were um, 
became masters at glass blowing. Um, that's in in Italy near Rome, uh, and so they were the best at glass blowing. Whereas um, in other places, they uh, really focused on uh, leather making, um, and uh, so different different cities focused on what they did best at and just traded. Uh, which really improves um, the efficiency of the economy as well. Jaden says, you don't have to worry about fighting your way across the desert. That is important. Um, so one of the key improvements that they, the Romans did, that other, other civilizations uh, did not do, is include uh, drainage. Um, they excelled at this sort of thing. Um, we already talked about how Roman concrete um, is, uh, the, the, the technology that the Romans used, it was lost, and then we only learned how to you do this, con you, uh, you build concrete um, 30 to 50 years ago, um, is when we first got this technology back that you know, was rediscovered. Um, so they had awesome concrete, uh, and in fact, this, uh, I'm not sure this pic diagram doesn't tell us. Um, I don't, I think this, uh, as Jaden says, this, um, this concrete right here in the middle, uh, right underneath the road is, is waterproof. And then the drains collect the water. Um, Jaden says, was it mixing volcanic ash with the cement? That was one of the really big improvements. Um, and they happen to be, uh, very close to um, to uh, Mount Vesuvius and other volcanoes, um, so they had um, they had access to that raw material, which um, many other civilizations uh, didn't have as easy access. Um, the water in the roads, I don't believe, was sent back for draining uh, or drinking. Um, yeah, until Vesuvius went kaboom. Then, um, well, that knocked out Pompeii, but uh, Naples is pretty close to, uh, you, you, can, you can see Naples from the top of Pompeii, and if the wind were blowing in a different direction, then it could have been Naples that, got, that disappeared, disappeared under ash um, instead of uh, Vesuvius. And it actually did get covered in some ash, but not... Not nearly as dangerous. Um, Pompeii just got unlucky because that's the direction that the the thermal flow broke out of the you know broke uh, out of the side of the mountain, and uh, so all of a sudden, whereas it did ha it was it used to be a column that went straight that directed straight up into the air, a hole broke into that column and it just put it out put out all of this hot lava and. Um, Insanely hot gas over to over uh, over 400 and 500 degree um, gases uh, straight through the town, and um, yeah, uh, pretty much uh, preserved everything exactly as it was. It was it hit everything so fast. Um, anything living uh, basically just froze. Um, not froze in the cold sense, but um, the ash, yeah, exactly. The ash froze them. It built up around around their around them and left cavities um, because it pretty much vaporized anything that was not stone. Um, yeah, it was pretty pretty awful. Um, but so yeah, that was an aside on volcanoes. Uh, unfortunately. We can't engineer volcanoes right now, and this is an engineering course. We can take, we can keep talking about volcanoes if you want, but um, these roads are pretty cool too. So I'm going to get back to these for now. Um, this is a picture, of, a modern day picture of a Roman road. I don't know the last time you saw, um, you know, the roads near uh, your house. I don't know how how well they seem to last. The roads near my house seem to get pretty get destroyed pretty quickly and granted we're driving cars on them which are much heavier and wear down we don't drive cars on this sort of thing um, but this road is still here and it was built over 2,000 years ago 
So they knew what they were doing. Um, but they were expensive. Um, the Romans were also a very wealthy nation, so that's how they were able to, to build these, and they had the natural materials um, nearby. Um, and actually, it was they didn't use slaves um, to build their roads, though. They mostly used soldiers. Um, I guess they could kind of be slaves. I don't know. Um, they, they did it by choice, so I guess they wouldn't be slaves. Um, but one of the really interesting things about this road construction was that they didn't use compass or maps, um, but they were perfectly straight. Look at this picture. See how they go straight up along, and while it might not be 100% perfect, that's pretty good. Um, so how do they do this? Well, they, they had this tool that's uh, called a groma, and how this works is that you stick a spike in the ground, <laughs> kilometer stick, Jaden says, um, that is basically kind of what this is. Um, it's a, if you've ever seen people by the side of the road uh, looking through a site um, and taking down measurements, um, I know at schools with architecture degree programs, at Virginia Tech we had an architecture program, and we'd see students holding something like basically an advanced groma that um, they stuck in the ground and they looked through a view hole and uh, someone held a post a long way off like this person did, is uh, you can see in this picture, and makes, makes sure things line up. And the only difference between this and that is, um, you know, slightly more accurate technology, uh, but uh, this did the job. So they, they kept adding posts every so often um, by, uh, well, this I think we'll explain. Um, Cape says their technology was better because it didn't make idiots. Um, people had to actually think, well, um, as for the people that actually used the Groma, they probably knew just about as much about architecture as the students in college that um, are using these tools because they just have to be trained how to use the tool and they don't need to know anything about architecture to um, to actually get some use out of the tool itself. Um, as long as they're trained, of course. Um, so how this works is um, it's a square cross with uh, at, at a right angle and each uh, piece, each end of the cross has lead weights, so the weights are pulled down by gravity, which ensures that you get two or four straight lines. Um, the, the right turn was so that you could make a right angle if you chose to connect a road and you wanted to make it perfectly right. Um, but uh, So what you would do is you... Um, you would look down one line, and as long if it lined up with the other line, then um, you could, uh, you know, you just you you looked at your la your pole that was that was farther away, and if that pole lined up with both of both of the strings that were hanging down in in a line, then um, this kind of shows shows a little better. Uh, yeah, surveying that's what this is called. Um, then uh, they hammer the post further into the ground. And if it's not right, they move their post a little bit um, to, to correct. Um, you might have heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome. Um, and that is not necessarily inaccurate, especially uh, in Europe. Um, if they didn't lead, the, if the roads didn't lead to Rome, chances are the main roads were built by the Romans, um, and many of these roads today um, have been paved over, and uh, I mean are are still some of the main routes. Um, just they they're paved over and made bigger and wider because we have cars that take up more space, um, but they're still the the main routes, and that actually set up um, a lot of towns 
Jason says, Highway 66 doesn't leave the room. That's true. Um, they never discovered America. So um, they didn't get quite that far, but they did do a lot of... <laughs> Theoretically, it leads to an airport, Gabe says, <laughs> which leads to Europe. Yes, that that is true. Um, <laughs> and the road from the airport leads to Rome. Uh, so, if you uh, if you can accept that argument, then all roads will eventually lead to Rome, as long as you're allowed air travel. Um, uh, so, let's move on to another uh, Roman technology. Um, they were the first to, uh, or among the first to really make use of arches. Um, not only are they incredibly elegant, but they're also very, um, very much more efficient. They can, they can use a lot fewer uh, materials and provide bigger openings. Um, and, you know, it, and it looks good. Jaden says, the roads which lead to England, to a road that leads to the channel tunnel, which is known as the channel, um, that leads to a road, <laughs> to another road that leads to a highway that leads to Rome. <laughs> uh, yes, that's true. Nowadays, you can actually drive through the channel. Um, in Roman times, you probably still had to take a boat. Um, though that didn't stop them, they still made it to uh, into England um, and some of England England's uh, main roads are were originally Roman roads um, so arches um, the the main uh, I'm not sure if you can read this diagram but I think you can see uh, that these arrows show the forces um, that how the the arch takes compression, compressive forces from the top, which we've learned that stones, rocks, bricks, uh, cement, they're all really good at compressive forces. Um, so it takes advantage of all of these compression forces and lets you uh, divert the compression um, into key points, um, which, are, which you make piers. And that lets you uh, not only not have to fill that entire space um, but it also lets you, um, you know, cover distances. You can now, um, if the gap's small enough, you can cover a bridge. Um, if it's uh, not small enough, then you might just have to build one pier in the middle of the bridge. Oh, sorry, we ran out of time. Um, okay. Uh, I lost track of time. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Uh, does anyone have to go right now? Or do you have a little bit more time? Um, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, and I'll try to make it quick. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll keep it down. Um, so I'll just, I'll quickly go through this because I think this is pretty cool stuff. Um, so the arches, we saw the Colosseum earlier and we talked about cement, but the arches also give it a lot of strength because it lets um, uh, it allows for a lot more visibility and less building materials so they can use uh, less materials to build uh, just as big of a thing without you know making it thicker that sort of thing um, it still took 131,000 cubic yards of stone to make um, which is pretty impressive um, it seated 50,000 people. Uh, fun fact, it could be, everyone could, if there was an emergency in the Colosseum, everyone could evacuate in 15 minutes. They were that good. Um, and they actually, the, our modern day Colosseums are modeled after um, our, you know, sports, sports arenas. Um, they're very basically modeled after the Colosseum. And there's, there's a lot of variations now, but um, especially our earlier sports arenas, 
Um, no, you can't get out of the Super Bowl stadium in 15 minutes, which is uh, all the more impressive that they seated 50,000 people um, uh, in the Coliseum. Uh, well, there's a lot of details on this slide, but um, not so much. Oh, oh, yeah. So one one interesting th thing to note is that they these arches. Uh, yeah, sure, Gabe. Go ahead and ask. These arches uh, are Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian for the three different tiers. Are you allowed to record these sessions? Yes, um, I record them too. Um, so. Um, let me figure out how I can send them to you, um, and I'll send send the recordings to all of you guys. Um, I think they're hosted on something like this. Okay. Also, three layers of not no columns, but these aqueducts um, are you, you know use the columns to save space and build up. Oh, you know what? Um, Apparently, this channel has to be used by the next class. So I'm really sorry, but I'm getting kicked off. Um, OK. So yeah, sorry, Jaden. Um, if you are able to come earlier, uh, I'll start earlier. Um, if not, sorry about that. Um, maybe we can watch it next time. But uh, talk to you guys later. And email me if you have any questions.